with us. First, we are having a talk on talk by Dr. M. Suresh Gandhi. And later, after that, we will be having a talk by Dr. Fatin Izazi Minhat from Malaysia. So first, I would like to uh, call upon Dr. Nandini CV, Asian professor from Christ College for <coughs> introducing our first speaker. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. We have Dr. M. Suresh Gandhi as our next speaker. Dr. Suresh Gandhi is the professor of Department of Geology, University of Madras. He is also the head of the Center for Environmental Science. Dr. Gandhi has more than eight years of expertise in the field of teaching and research in the field of micropaleontology, environmental geology, geochemistry, geomorphology, hydrogeology, and heavy mineral studies. He has mentored and supervised a number of MSc projects, MPhil degrees, and PhDs. He had successfully completed various research projects funded by esteemed funding agencies like University Grants Commission, Ministry of Earth Science, Department of Science and Technology, Council for Science and Industrial Research, etc. He had delivered more than 80 invited talks in the DST Inspire camps. He was an active participant and presenter for more than hundreds of national and international conferences. He served as a member in Institutional Animal Ethical Committee, Government of India, Ministry of Environmental and Forest Animal Welfare Division. He is an international advisory editorial board member for International Journal of Earth Science and Engineering. He is an editorial board member for International Journal of Earth Sciences. He is a lifetime member in Gondwana Geology Society, Nagpur, past, past global changes, Switzerland. International Quaternary Research Union, UK. With this short introduction, I conclude and welcome Dr. Suresh Gandhi to deliver his talk. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a brief introduction about me. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you, all the delegates. And uh, today I'm going to deliver a talk on uh, uh, risk assessment of heavy metal contamination in estuaries and coastal regions, uh, particularly few case studies in Tamil Nadu. Uh, this uh, presentation uh, exclusively for uh, research scholars and students I prepared. Um, I think most of the senior professors, um, please excuse me. <coughs> and um, before this uh, talk, uh, all of you know about what is environmental geochemistry. First of all, you know that term. The environmental geochemistry is the application of uh, chemical principles to predict the fate of organic and uh, inorganic pollutants at the earth crust surface, hydrosphere, and in the atmospheres. So the metal pollutants, they are treated using the equilibrium with the solids and also aqueous solutions. So environmental geochemistry uh, investigate the impact of uh, natural geochemical processes and human-induced uh, anthropogenic processes, and also uh, uh, like uh, natural resources, like we call as river, lake, soil, forest, as well as human health, okay? So environmental chemistry is concerned with the sources and also distribution and interaction of chemical elements in uh, rock, soil, water, uh, air, uh, plant, animal, human systems, okay? Here, the, the primary sources of elements mainly uh, of. Sir, yes. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can you please yes. share your slide? Yeah, I'm uh, just introducing. Ah, sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. So the primary source of the elements are the igneous rocks, that is, uh, uh, silicates and aluminosilicates, which are the uh, dominant uh, components. Okay, certain chemical uh, principles are essential for understand uh, the environmental problems and then to use the principles can be applied to solve the real world problems. So here, uh, heavy metals, that is the natural constitution of the earth crust, uh, but it, uh, this indiscriminate human activities have drastically altered their geochemical cycle and their biogeochemical geochemical balances. So any toxic uh, metals, we call this uh, heavy metals. Otherwise, uh, any metal or metalloid of the environmental concerns, okay? Here, this term uh, uh, originated with the reference to the harmful effects 
particularly arsenic, beryllium, cadmium, chromium, lead, mercury, even nickel, selenium. So they are the these are the metal persist in nature, and also it causes the damages or death in animals and humans, and also plants, even at a very low concentration. So any toxic metals we call as heavy metals. So they are mainly produced by the industrial activities and also deposits slowly in the surrounding water and soils. Okay. And also they are very heterogeneous group of elements, widely in their chemical properties and also biological functions. They are kept under the environmental pollution categories, mainly due to the toxic effects of plants, animals, and the human beings. Here, um, uh, different sources for contamination of the, uh, takes place. Uh, one is called, we call as anthropogenic activities, like uh, mining, uh, smelting operations, and also agricultures. They are all locally increase the level of heavy metals um, into the soil up to the dangerous levels. Okay. So, the impact of heavy metals on aquatic organisms is uh, due to the movement of pollutions from various diffusers or point sources, uh, which give rise to the coincidental mixture of the ecosystem. Uh, it poses a great threat to the aquatic fauna, especially to the fishes, which constitute one of the major sources of protein rich food for mankind. Here, uh, uh, all of you know the properties. Uh, heavy metals, they are conventionally defined as the element with the metallic properties and an uh, atomic number is uh, greater than 20, okay? Um, so they are naturally occurring elements. They have the high atomic weight and also density is uh, at least five times greater than that of water. Um, and also here you can see, uh, they have a high density, toxic in nature, non-degradable. Uh, they are a shininess lecture, high melting point. They have is a high melting point. And also they are a good conductors of heat and electricity, uh, non-degradable, malleable, ductile. So everything, uh, uh, properties, these are all the properties. So here, uh, main transport phenomena is by water, food, air. Uh, absorption or absorption into the various materials. Uh, coming to the toxic disease in uh, uh, heavy metals, here uh, aluminium that is associated with the uh, Alzheimer and also Parkinson uh, diseases, senility and uh, dementia. And also if you inhale more arsenic, arsenic exposure can cause cancer and also abdominal pain and uh, black food diseases. And uh, cadmium, that is also one of the dangerous. It causes uh, kidney damage and hypertension. And uh, lead and mercury, both can lead the joint diseases and ailments of the kidneys, uh, circulatory systems, and also uh, nervous systems. Uh, nickel, uh, it causes damage to the lung, liver, and also the kidney. Uh, chromium uh, can cause the lung damage and cancers. As I told you earlier, know that uh, various sources, anthropogenic source and the natural source. Natural source means mostly from, uh, for example, the mercury contamination, if you take, it is coming from the volcanic eruption and also by rock weathering and also by uh, natural fires. And anthropogenic itself, we have an intentional source and also in, that, in, in advertence uh, resources, like uh, folk medicines in cosmetics, dental amalgams and vaccines. Whereas in anthropogenic inadvent source, uh, if you see this uh, mercury mining, smelting, and also burning of the fossil fuels, coal-fired uh, power plants, municipal uh, waste, and also during the cement production, chlorine alkaline productions, these are all the some anthropogenic inadvent sources. Um, for, uh, again, one more thing is you can see here, mercury, uh, high toxic in vapor, but vapor form, it is high toxic in the vapor form, whereas uh, lead, cadmium, arsenic, they, they are the more toxic in the cationic forms. Um, so the toxicity arises from the strong affinity of the heavy metal cations for sulfurs. Uh, medicinal treatment is also there to uh, reduce this heavy metal poisoning 
that is done by gelatin therapy by administrating the compounds we call the gelats. So we, the example one is called BAL, that is a British anti levasty dimorphopol injection is there, and ethylene diamond tetracyclic acid, that is also the uh, control measurements. So overall, this uh, toxic uh, trace heavy metals or trace metals, uh, what is the entry point, how it is entered into the uh, human systems, mainly by inhalation and also by injection. Otherwise, absorption through the skins. So most of the metals enter into the root by the inhalation and the injection methods. Again, uh, different toxic effects are occurred on both sides. So this is the one of the data uh, uh, taken from 2006, so that is uh, how much uh, affected various locations. For example, in China, Linfen, um, due to the various industries there, the various gases and particulates are polluted. Like in uh, China, that is in uh, Dominican uh, Republic, uh, lead uh, pollutant is more due to battery recycling is there. And in Tamil Nadu, one location is Velur district in uh, Ranipet, uh, full of tannery industries are more. So there, from there we get a uh, chemical pollutions. It affects the water and also soils. And in uh, Kyrgyzstan, there are also a uh, uh, Soviet era uranium plant is there. So most uh, radioactivity waste are exposed and it affects the soil and water. Similarly, in uh, Russia, uh, there is also a platinum production at the mills. It uh, affects, it leads to the uh, sulfur dioxide discharge and strontium, cesium, and others like that. So these are all some examples. So let me, let me see the mercury. This is the most volatile of the all metals. They are highly toxic in a vapor form. Um, liquid mercury itself is not highly toxic, and most of that are ingested is excreted. Whereas, uh, uh, if you see the methyl mercury, that is most dangerous from the mercury. Uh, here, uh, the mercury bio transformed in sediments into the methyl mercury by aquatic microbes. So the bio accumulates through the aquatic food chain in largely predatory fishes, tuna, mackerel, uh, shark, these are all uh, the um, accumulates. So the entire human body uh, through the fish consumption um, will be damaged. And uh, through the breathing air containing the mercury vapors, that is also major causes. So, Already all of you know that the Minamata Bay, that is in Japan, uh, Chiso factory. So a great disaster happened uh, during 1950s and 1960s. That is also a major trace metal pollution epidemics. Here this uh, Chisasco, Chisco factory, uh, they discharge the uh, mercury uh, through the sewages. You can see here most of the phytoplanktons and through the bioaccumulations that they take onto the humans, then it causes dangerous, uh, more number of people are died. So the methyl mercury poisoning of the central nervous systems due to uh, that the contaminated fishes. Then if you take lead alone, it has a low melting point of uh, 326 degrees centigrade. It is used as a structural metal in ancient times and for uh, weatherproofing buildings. The Romans, they are used in uh, water tanks and also in cooking vessels. Uh, if you take the major source, uh, they are uh, used in the building industries for roofing and also uh, flashing for uh, uh, sound proofings. Mostly they are used in the pipes also. Lead is used in the pipes. Uh, suppose it, it combined with the tin, uh, it forms a solder uh, used in electronics and also in other applications. So there is a connection between the solid metals. Uh, so the lead shot is banned in the United States, Canada, and also Netherlands, Norway, and uh, Denmark. And uh, you can see the it is also used in the paints. Here the lead chromate, uh, that is the yellow pigment used in the paint. Uh, usually applied to the school buses and uh, 
the lead is also used in uh, corrosion resistant paints and as a bright red color and also it is used in the ceramic dishwares so the leaching of lead from the glazed ceramics that uh, used to prepare the food that is the major source of dietary lead especially in the mexicos so in the past uh, lead salt they were used as a color agents in the various foods okay main uh, effect uh, comes from the lead so that is a high level uh, high levels during high levels inorganic lead is a general metabolic poisons so lead poisoning uh, affects the neurological and also the reproductive systems best example that is a downfall of roman europe so now research teams from the uh, universities they are investing how lead poisoning affected the human health in the roman empire okay so lead breaks the blood brain barrier and interferes with the normal development of the brain in fans um, not only that uh, lead is observed to the lower iq levels in the children uh, and also uh, lead is transformed uh, postnatally from the mother in her breast milk at elevated levels lead poisoning would eventually result in the death okay then uh, coming to the cadmium cadmium lies in the same subgroups of the periodic table uh, as zinc and uh, mercury but it is more similar to the zinc so coal burning is the main source of the environmental cadmium incineration of waste it containing the cadmium is an important source of the metal in the environment cadmium is also the most toxic in uh, its ionic uh, form unlike uh, mercury again uh, uh, nickel batteries so that is used as electrode and also uh, they are used in the pigment in paints uh, mostly in the photovoltaic uh, devices and also in the tv screens uh, for uh, uh, high uh, density qualities they use this cadmium screens and during the cigarette smokes fertilizers and pesticides so the great proportions of this exposure of the cadmium come from the our food supply seafood organ meats particularly kidneys and also from potatoes rice and other grains you will get some this cadmium cadmium effects so most uh, you can see the toxicity of this cadmium uh, severe uh, pain in the joints uh, bone disease and also kidney problems uh, lifetime in the body in so it can withstand in several years Uh, so there is the greatest risk uh, uh, countries like japan and central europe they have this uh, cadmium pollutions so it lay, it leads to the uh, serious health problems related to bone liver kidneys and also finally death then uh, arsenic arsenic oxides are more common poisonous uh, for murder and also suicide uh, from roman times onwards through the middle ages uh, here uh, they are widely used as pesticides before uh, the organic chemical era similarly to the phosphorus this one so mostly main source where you get from this arsenic by pesticides uh, mining and also production of iron and steel combustion of coal leach leach out from abundant gold mines and used as a wood preserve preservatives in india if you take uh, the most affected areas that is in uh, ganges basin uh, north east in india that is located very close to the uh, bangladesh not only that the arsenic emitted from a copper smelting plant that is in bulgaria uh, that has been uh, shown recently they have produced a three fold uh, increase in the birth defects in newborn children in that area okay so most daily exposure of arsenic by north american adults that is mainly due to the food food intake especially of meat and seafoods uh, you can see this uh, arsenic affect uh, person so entire skin is affected with arsenic again this is also how the arsenic affect the human beings arsenate uh, as3 is more toxic than uh, arsenate as5 so generally the drinking water it has a permissible limit uh, 10 pb only so if it is increased no it will cause uh, damages so that uh, 
if you see the uh, water level studies, uh, most of the metals which are above the permissible limit, like uh, arsenic, cadmium, chromium, and uh, uh, lead. Uh, out of, uh, you can see the data arsenic 153 districts in overall uh, 21 states uh, have affected with arsenic. That is, the permissible limit is beyond the water, <coughs> beyond the permissible limits, like uh, lead also in 93 districts and the chromium and cadmium. So some trace metals uh, like boron, uh, copper, iron, uh, zinc, uh, they are uh, uh, essential for health, but uh, uh, they have tendency to accumulate in the body uh, or bioaccumulate in organisms low in the food chain from uh, some source at relatively low concentrations. Like uh, chromium pollution and tanneries, you can see this diagram, wherever the tannery locations will affect with the uh, chromium pollutions. So, uh, for uh, geochemical studies, uh, uh, there are various methods for measurements uh, the uh, metals. So the most common method of uh, that is the collecting uh, particulate matter uh, through the filters. So the identification of the concentration of the individual uh, trace metals like lead, cadmium, arsenic, zinc, mercury, chromium, we are using X-ray fluorescence, XRF, and also uh, uh, another one is uh, all of you know that AAS, that is uh, Atomic Absorption Spectrophotometer. And uh, ICP AES, that is uh, inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectrophotometer. So here uh, it is uh, elemental analysis for uh, rock, ore minerals, water samples, and also biological samples. So this technique is outstanding good for uh, determination of rare earth elements, uh, uh, particularly in geological samples, um, even in the lower concentration levels. Like ICP MS, that is an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrophotometer. This is also very useful for elemental analysis of uh, rocks, ores, minerals, environmental samples, biological samples in parts per billion levels, and even below. So the rare earth elements mm -hmm. determined directly without carrying any separation and the pre-concentration. OK. One minute. Hello. Then, um, so these are all uh, the few work we have done. Um, this paper is uh, accepted recently in the Marine Pollution Bulletin, how the heavy metal pollution assessment uh, distribution and the source determination in the uh, surface sediments from Tamil Nadu shoreline, south east coast of India. So they hear the, the uh, we collected sample from uh, Basanagar to uh, Sadarangapatnam, that is the North Tamil Nadu coast. So to find out the heavy metals like mm -hmm. iron, magnus, chromium, uh, lead, copper, mm -hmm. to measure the coastal contaminants. Mm -hmm. One minute, please. Hello, it is audible. Audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, 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 okay. Sir, can you please uh, turn to slideshow? Yeah, yeah, one minute.
slideshow is not coming here. Sir, please press the escape button. Yeah, it is coming. Ah, yes, sir. Now it's clear. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for determining the uh, pollution status and the spatial distribution of the steady area, uh, we use the following indices for pollution. One is called the pollution load index. Another one is called contamination factor and the enrichment factor, and also the geoaccumulation index that is called IGO. Uh, so how to find out the contamination factor and the pollution load index? Uh, we are using this formula that is called CF equal to C metal by C shale values. That is a, a metal concentration that is called a C metal and CS that is a C shale value. That is the world average concentration of the considered elements reported by the shale, reported for the shales. That was uh, uh, followed by the Vedafol 1995 methods. And also the pollution load index that is called PLI, we can using this formula that is NB uh, CF1 into CF2 into CF3 and so on, that is up to CFN. That is uh, contamination factor and N is the, CF is the contamination factor and N is the number of metals. So the pollution load index represents number of times by which the heavy metal concentration in the sediments exceeds the background concentration. And also it gives the cumulative indi indications of the overall level of heavy metal toxicity in the particular samples. And uh, in geoaccumulation index uh, that is called uh, IGO, uh, to, enrichment, to estimate the enrichment of metal concentration above the background or base level, uh, baseline concentration, uh, from that we calculate the geoaccumulation index. Uh, several enrichment classes that can be uh, followed in this. And uh, last one is the uh, enrichment factor, that is a uh, EF, valuable indicator, it reflects the status of environmental contamination. So this tool is used to, to tell about the sources of uh, trace metal, whether they uh, originate from natural source or anthropogenic source, and uh, this tool is a vital part of geochemical studies. And this table, uh, you can see the range. Suppose the geoaccumulation index is greater than five means that this area is extremely polluted. It is in between uh, four to five, severely extremely polluted, and three to four is severely polluted, two to three is moderately polluted, and one to two is again uh, moderately polluted, and zero to one is slightly polluted and uh, less than zero indicated unpolluted. So like that, we can uh, find out uh, the accumulation index based upon the accumulated in index. We, we tell about which area is uh, polluted and or it is uh, not polluted. And also the contamination factor values, uh, less means it is a low contamination. If it is uh, one to three means moderately contaminated and uh, three to six, it indicates uh, considerably contaminated and if it is greater than six means uh, very high contaminations. Similarly, the enrichment factor uh, table, uh, we can uh, matching. Uh, if it is less than one means uh, no enrichment based on the uh, degree of metal pollution according to Taylor 1964. Uh, minor enrichment means one to three and moderate enrichment is three to five. Severe enrichment that is 10 to 25 extremely severe enrichment is greater than 50, okay? And then, uh, yeah. And uh, this is uh, one of our uh, studied in uh, Gulf of Manar, uh, a long uh, a sediment core. Slide it, yeah. A sediment core uh, uh, collected uh, from off two to green coast. You can see here um, at a depth of 1,320 meters. Uh, so the Gulf of Manar is a transitional zone between the uh, Arabian Sea and also the Indian Ocean. 
and it is connected uh, with Bay of Bengal through the shallow sill that is the uh, box strait. Uh, using the uh, Trapathan classification, we find out that location there, the core um, was subsampled uh, five centimeter interval. Uh, so mostly the sediment is uh, silty in nature. So otherwise muddy, mud also is there. So muddy nature of sediment uh, generally it indicates the calm sedimentation without any turbulence. Um, similarly, the high water content of the mud dominant sample indicate they were deposited relatively recent time. Again, uh, the mud accumulate that indicates they are the muddy sediments deposited seasonally. So here the silt and clay fractions have been flushed out and uh, transported from the Indian coast and the continental shelf region, especially from the Tutukurin to uh, Cape Comorian coast, and they are deposited in the deep sea of the Gulf of Mannar. So we've uh, uh, calculated the uh, ecological parameters of the calcium carbonate and also the organic matter. So the calcium carbonate generally known to diluter of the trace metal concentration, and also they contributed mainly by terrestrial runoff of organisms in the water column. Here, uh, the calcium carbonate values are generally uh, very low in nature, generally medium to uh, medium nature. That means, I mistake here, 1.6 to 13 only it is there. So less cell fragments. So the organic matter, if you take the top, we have uh, around uh, one to two percentage, whereas at bottom it is, uh, very low organic matter. And coming to this uh, trace element like uh, magnus, chromium, copper, nickel, cobalt, lead, zinc, cadmium, uh, mostly it shows the decreasing uh, trends. Initially, chromium is uh, more than followed by magnus, zinc, nickel. So like that we found. Then we compare with the other uh, studied data with our present locations. And this area is not much polluted. If you see, whereas the shallow cores in the near Bay of Bengal, where the MN value is 529, whereas in our study, uh, it is not that much. Okay, like that, we can compare. So this is the another uh, uh, study we carried out that is, uh, geochemical variation of trace element in the recent sediments of uh, Gulf of Manar, surface sediments. So here the uh, surface sediments were collected uh, in two different uh, oceanographic buoys. So 32 surface sediment samples uh, collected in each season. Uh, around 64 samples and only the average, all the trace metal concentrations are presented in this work. So for that, uh, same two grams of uh, samples were used for acid leaching of sediments with 25% uh, of uh, uh, acetic acid uh, treatment, then uh, added and separated for acid leachable uh, uh, trace elements analysis according to Loring Ratnala 1992. Yeah. From uh, these studies, we found uh, white, yeah, organic matter concentration. If you see the calcium carbonate and organic matter are uh, the southern part and also in the northern part, we can, we can uh, divert our uh, distinguished our study area like that. Here, uh, the high concentration of uh, calcium carbonate values, you can see 75, 63, these are all the high values uh, that indicate that a major source of carbonate uh, materials uh, mainly due to the shell fragments and also uh, the input from adjacent land mass where the tertiary limestones and the calcareous sandstone extended in the southern regions. Whereas you can see comparatively is, uh, low values in the northern part mainly due to here you are all silty sand and sand, but here you can see 
clay type uh, fine nature of sediments so they do not support these uh, biogenic activities and uh, uh, distribution of organic matter uh, here also low values they are all low values they are uh, diluting effect of uh, calcium carbonate present in these steady areas so like that we oh then then um, yeah so the low values of this uh, organic uh, carbon in the steady area um, are uh, combined by the time integrating uh, nature of marine sedimentation and mixing process of uh, sediment water interface so the rate of delivery as well as rate of degradation by microbial medicated process can be high in that regions so like that we observed and then um, you can see here uh, the trace element uh, uh, data here the concentration of metals iron magnesium uh, chromium copper nickel cobalt lead zinc and also cadmium they are substantially higher to the close of the stations near the shores uh, that too in the northern part of the steady area and also the southern part of the steady area here the concentration you can see um this varies from uh, different ranges that means there may be high and uh, low values the near shore stations and also in the middle part of the shelf areas so mostly the sediment interaction is also uh, the main reason for this uh, uh, high concentration of trace metals in particular stations some somewhere here in 29 and 38 location you can see the high concentration of trace elements in uh, 29 and uh, up to 32 um, and also in few stations that indicate that is a greater mixing at the shallowest depth and also uh, similar concentration of metals in other stations indicate uh, due to that uh, sandy natures not only that in gulf of mannar uh, there may be the winnowing uh, actions so it has prevented the greater accumulation of fine grain material so and the waves from storms it refract through the coastal regions so this this way we find out and uh, the enrichment factor values you can see here the order indicates high anthropogenic input of metals like uh, chromium uh, everything that is in the coastal sediments so why this higher uh, anthropogenic input input means that location uh, they have a um, various activities the thermal power plant is there harbor activities uh, so the large industrial input along the coast through the damarabani river we can get this type of enrichment so similar type of enrichment values were also observed in the baltic that is in boston harbor san francisco bay sediments and uh, this is one more study in off kadalur region of kadalur uh, that is coastal water cw these are all coastal waters and rw that is in upana river so that is a river water so we compare the coastal water as well as uh, the river water that is in the upana river kadalur here uh, this table shows the the results of uh, physicochemical parameters of uh, um, ph values and uh, do uh, salinity mostly uh, there there will be the slight uh, variations uh, is found after the that means one area is called a river end side and another area is called a, a marine uh, regions so suppose if you take the salinity you can see here river side it is very lowest value in the river end whereas the salinity will be higher in the marine end but uh, there is a intermediate saline in between area whereas you can see the ph uh, 
in the river uh, water uh, mostly they are all semi alkaline nature so that it shows the dominance of uh, uh, coastal water mixing in that areas so the variation in this uh, ph in the uh, river water mainly again due to the industrial effluence from the adjoining alkaline chemical industries so like that we concluded so here also we can find out the average surface and bottom water uh, so this is present study values compare with other uh, bay of bengal studies with other workers uh, according to jonathan he worked on coastal waters of gulf of munnar and selvaraju in kalpakam coast and uh, satyanarayana in uh, again the western bay of bengal subramaniam and anada lakshmi kumari in sagapatinam uh, and satyanarayana et al at sagapatinam and rajendra et al at uh, inshore waters in the western bay of bengal so comparatively our result is more similar to near like kalpakam studies according to selvaraj so this data shows again coastal waters uh, results so the here uh, the in fp values near the uh, mouth of upanar river is smaller that indicate low values in the high saline regions so the fp values is whereas the higher concentration of uh, in in the river water that indicates some input of local source in the downstream side of the rivers so like that if we studied and one more uh, study we carried out uh, of kadalur so we collected uh, 12 samples in the of kadalur region and we find out uh, trace metal study as well as microfossil and uh, already first uh, talk uh, uh, dr rajiv nigam explained about the microfossil particularly foraminifera pollution in the cultural studies of mercury similarly we collected sediment samples and uh, find the microfossils and how it is affected due to the heavy metal pollutions so here uh, generally fossils uh, look like normal size means the aperture and uh, um all other features are not uh, disturbed that means it is the normal species suppose if uh, it is altered or modified or some changes so we called as a deformative species so like that uh, here you can see one particular species elpidium advanum that is a normal species whereas you can see the next diagram here the chamber arrangements are distorted so last two chambers not even in shape so like that in this uh, diagram you can notice the deformed species all the 12 stations we found uh, deformative species particularly the station number 1 2 3 we have high number of deformation species are noticed and also in station 7 8 9 also we get more deformative species similarly the trace element distribution also more high that the blue color lead and chromium these are all high concentration so the percentages of deformities less in the deeper depths where the sample collected off the kadalur at the shallow depth the morphology deformities are greater okay that is one thing we observed then the distribution of uh, this trace metal in the industrial zone of kadalur here lot huge industrial area this area the shoreline area uh, that shows the dissolved phase of iron and manganese are higher whereas the strong evidence for the lower oxygen condition at the upana river and also the along the coastal zones so here uh, high concentration of trace metal in the upana river is also also fairly depend on the increase of ph and the salinity in the water column so the trace metals like mn chromium copper nickel lead zinc uh, they are strongly influenced by the local industry input as well as the redox transformation of iron and manganese so these are all you can see spirocolina costifera 
with the regular shape same phylloclina costifera inside view you can see the abnormal uh, growth of chambers and again spirocolina communis this one particular species having only one aperture in regular form whereas uh, uh, here it is a two apertures similarly that uh, this indicates uh, heavy metal impacts easily affected the microfossils and this also one of our studies in uh, uh, pot bay that is between uh, sri lanka and india um, a lot of you know this location pot strait we call here the trace elements uh, we collected uh, 42 samples in the offshore region from uh, starting from mandavam athangarai devi patinam tondi kotai patinam manamelkudi seduva chatiram mallipatinam and kodaikarai locations and uh, here uh, mostly cadmium concentration slightly increased from the manamelkudi is the uh, middle point uh, so we deviated this manamelkudi as a central point and uh, Uh, north of manamelkudi and also south of manamelkudi so like that here uh, the southern part of manamelkudi that is in tondi region uh, the concentration is increased and uh, here uh, cadmium concentration uh, the value shows 0.1362.980 ppm so higher cadmium observed in this uh, manamekudi regions especially in the tondi regions there uh, some industrial wastages uh, due to some anthropogenic activities this may be occur so like that we concluded from uh, the studies then um, and then yeah and this is also one more paper uh, recently we submitted to the journal and uh, accepted mm-hmm. ready for publication that is an assessment of heavy metal accumulations in the um, coal mine affected agricultural soil particularly in the neveli here uh, so we collected sample for uh, soil sample as well as uh, water sample in uh, paddy field uh, along the canal settle set uh, canals along the, all along the canals sediment soils and also the water soils we collected and same uh, method we followed like uh, for water sample analysis also we did all uh, pgc cts the field itself and for surface sample we did uh, pgc cts and salinity and uh, organic matter calcium carbonate and using the digestion method we find out the trace element observation using atomic absorption spectrophotometer for find out the pollution indices similarly for water sample also we did all other parameters using some titration method spectrophotometer method and the flame photometer method to know the quality to qualitative studies and geochemical studies here the overall average concentration of lead copper iron magnesium zinc uh, in the soil sample ranges from 34 59 54 to 9 respectively so the order of dominance maximum mn zinc uh, copper iron lead is there again uh, the lead concentration that is spread over to the maximum part of the study area we found so main reason that is anthropogenic processes like usage of fertilizer domestic mm-hmm. effluents uh, and uh, this also the main uh, reason for that and one more study this is from uh, kerala we worked on uh, kadalundi estuary that is um, the kadalundi is the one of the four most uh, important rivers flowing through malappuram district of kerala and also this is the border line between kolikode and malappuram district but uh, here uh, the heavy metal concentrations are not much uh, pollution here uh, only the chromium nickel uh, will be found in our studies so they may be due to some industrial effluents or some uh, urban runoff on nearby regions of the study area maybe it may be the reason 
and also one more uh, work we did in uh, again karekal uh, to bumbugar central part of tamil nadu coast and we compare with the other uh, um, studied uh, result and uh, here in east coast of india this our result shows the chromium value is 389 magnus 1641 cobalt 23 and nickel 42 and the zinc is 90 uh, so here also um, not much polluted with uh, some metals but a few metals will be in pollution condition mainly that is also due to some uh, fishermen boat activities like that we concluded and the two more core samples we collected in uh, muthupet mangrove regions uh, along the mullipalam creek this is full of mangrove environment uh, core samples so again uh, we find out at the depth of 40 to 90 some variations this this work here also the one core uh, that having the higher amount of apmn uh, co than to the other core that is manifesting the hydraulic condition that include water movement and the circulation current so high higher mud and clay content also facilitate the deposit of metal in that area like that we concluded and also we studied in the river course in pondicherry district of Ka karekal states that is in one is called puravadana restuary and another one is um vetta restuary but uh, yeah, yeah we collected the core samples and also the surface samples we did all the grain size studies uh, enrichment factor analysis and we using the surfer we uh, plot all the diagrams and this area is not much affected similarly we studied in arsalar and thirumalai rajan uh, river area and compare this area also not much affected from our conclusions so these are all few i i think uh, already running time too much time i take so i want to conclude my uh, talk so just one or two slides how foramini uh, 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 foraminifera deformatives due to this heavy metal pollution like uh, chamber aperture mm -hmm. umbilical coiling and test abnormalities see this diagram one more diagram see this is how i took from uh, various sources how the heavy metal will affect the foraminifera this one similarly maximum uh, according to yanko et al he she explained that uh, copper and zinc that is the um, major uh, 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 values if it is high values will affect uh, leads to the deformities see normal species number 1 whereas in number 2 it is abnormalities again same species you can see various up to 7 you can see the abnormalities of peneroplis planatus so like that similarly valentina and goes in marine pollutant blood you can see entire species are polluted due to heavy metals and one more uh, ready paper you can see lot of deformities reduced test and the twisted chambers everything is there so finally i uh, conclude my lecture so please save our environment thank you thank you sir that was really deep as well as you have done a lot of work so uh, if there is any questions from the participant side actually one there is one question from miss yamini malhotra what amount of arsenic can one take in the drinking water yeah i already told no less than uh, 10 pb if more arsenic uh, it will leads uh, most of the carcinogenic diseases will be happen but there is a remedial measures also there if you, you take more input of fresh water automatically the arsenic will be removed so due to time constraint i think we will reduce the uh, okay, number okay. of questions i will share your with your permission i will thank share you. your mail id and phone number here thank you sir so th thank you uh, dr m suresh gan sir so i would like to invite uh, professor jaymon sunny for introducing our next speaker over to you sir
<clears throat> okay so our next speaker is dr fatin isati bindi minhat she hey, she is a micro paleontologist and the topic is uh, tropical benthic foraminifera as bio indicator for marine ecosystems she is a faculty of she is working as a lecturer in the faculty of science and marine environment university malaysia terangeni umt she did did her, her phd in marine geology in the year 2016 before that she has done her bsc in applied geology in 2010 and an msc in marine sciences in 2013 she had led eight research projects in micropaleontology also she has worked as environment impact assessment consultant also guiding msc students over to you madam fatin isatti bindi minhat thank you sir for the warm welcome so um, first of all i would like to thank um, everyone for inviting me uh, especially uh, professor suresh gandhi for inviting me to be part of this um, very good colloquium for three days i've been listening to you know so many topics of the past future and current situation so right now i would like to talk about a little bit on foraminifera i think most of you has heard um, a lot about foraminifera so um, i am trying to share my screen uh, share Um, yes. Um, um, there will I, be a share screen button, which will be. Yes, I, I, um, yes, uh, I'm clicking share right now. Uh, hopefully, you all can view yes, the screen. As long, as long. Yes, now, it's on, yeah. Right? All right, all right. So I'm making it a slideshow. All right, Thank all right. You. So um, today um. We'll be talking about uh, tropical benthic foraminifera as bioindicator for marine ecosystems. So, for um, most geologists, when we talk about foraminifera, um, we will think about the fossils. But for a biologist, uh, when we talk about foraminifera, it is more on uh, how they live currently in the modern ocean and what are the ecology that they prefer to live in. So, um, I will be talking more on modern. Uh, for foraminifera, but by understanding um, the modern ecology of the foraminifera, I think we can interpret the paleo counterpart better. So uh, we have to have both um, for us to understand uh, what the past has taught us and what the future will, uh, you know, have for us. All right. So I think uh, there are several talks on foraminifera already, but since uh, this is uh, in my slide, I am going through it again. Um, so basically, foraminifera is a single cell. They have a shell-like structure. We call this uh, shell test. And this test is actually to uh, keep uh, or protect their cytoplasm. So you imagine amoeba having uh, a shell. So that is uh, what foraminifera is, all right? So um, foraminifera can be found in all marine environment. And they are also present in marginal environment. When I say marginal environment, uh, for, uh, for geologists, I, I think we know that marginal means closer to the uh, coastline, closer to uh, river outputs, and things like that. So um, marginal may include um, estuary, lagoons, mangroves, salt marshes. So you can still find for a mini for that. All right, so um, the first appearance uh, of foraminifera was recorded back in Cambrian. So they are quite um, uh, among the oldest uh, organisms. Um, they have existed since the 500 million years ago. And they indeed have survived the five mass extinction. So um, during the early days, um, most of this, um, especially during Cambrian, most of this benthic Foraminifera is very, very simple. So if you, you can see from my slide, these are more complex uh, foraminifera. But in the old days, uh, especially in the Cambrian period, 
the foraminifera was uh, a single chamber organism. They do not secrete or they do not make their own tests, but instead um, they take uh, particles, sand particles, or you know whatever particles that are available to them, and they build their tests. So those are um, the early form of foraminifera, and most of them are benthic. And finally, I think they evolve um, to the planktonic group, which means they are um, the ancestor was more of uh, those that live on the seafloor and they evolved to be able to swim or float, I would, I would say float uh, during the Mesozoic. So you have lots and lots of black, uh, planktonic foraminifera evolving during this uh, Mesozoic. All right, so I think I've mentioned about benthic and planktonic. So uh, if you're smart, you will uh, study the planktonic foraminifera because um, to be honest, benthic foraminifera have much, much more species compared to the planktonic forams. So the benthic group, as I mentioned before, they live um, within or on the surface of the seafloor. Uh, they appear close to coral reef. You can also see them in the deep sea environment. They are also in mangrove environment. And planktonic foraminifera, they are more of a open water um, species. So they float on the uh, water column, especially the surface. And some of them can even live in the uh, thermocline uh, layer. So this is how they are very useful in uh, geochemical uh, analysis, um, especially when you're looking at you know, sea surface temperature, the changes of uh, paleoproductivity and things like that. So um, as I said again, if you would like your work to be much easier, planktonic is the best choice. But if you like more challenging uh, study, benthic would be uh, the best thing to study. All right, so I'll be focusing on the benthic itself today because um, my work Mm, I am um, representing a work that is uh, related to pollution um, and something that has to do with anthropogenic effect. So why do we study foraminifera? So in the early days, uh, I would say in the early 1900, um, most uh, geologists study the fossil of foraminifera because um, their fossil is a very useful index fossil. They can tell um, the stratigraphic age. They can even you know, um, interpret what is the depositional environment. So in the early days, uh, if you have a look at the um, Cushman, or uh, if you're familiar with foraminifera work, you look at one of the study uh, or the, the published work by Cushman, and his work is more on foraminifera related to economy and oil and gas. So they are very, very important in oil and gas exploration. And this has been, um, I mean, still is, quite important, although most of this um, um, skill has been replaced by geophysical uh, equipment, but I think it is still very important for us to determine age, um, rock ages, uh, by using the index fossil of foraminifera. And what else? Um, in the, uh, the old days, uh, they are also important to interpret the depositional environment you can tell by looking at the uh, assemblage in the core or in the well section, you can tell what type of um, environment that uh, particular uh, sediment or deposition, depositional uh, fraction or section is. So this way, uh, scientists can you know, tell whether this is deep sea or shallow shelf or is it a coral reef uh, environment. And other than that, foraminifera coloration index can also tell us whether you know there's hydrocarbon uh, beneath or was it you know uh, a, a possible hydrocarbon um, beneath um, that particular stratigraphy uh, rock. All right, so my uh, study today is more on the application of foraminifera in environmental monitoring. So we are looking at how we can use this modern benthic foraminifera to interpret or to tell what is the condition, health condition of uh, the marine environment. So here 
is when it started. So since the 1960, uh, the work on foraminifera in pollution monitoring has gained uh, so much interest. And uh, one of the famous, I think, most uh, cited and referred to review would be the ELF 1995. Uh, that study, uh, that review itself has um, accumulated or put together what are the important works that has been done in pollution monitoring with regard to foraminifera. So most study has dealt uh, with organic waste and how this has changed the foraminifera assemblage and various kinds of chemical pollution. I think um, we've listened to Professor Suresh Gandhi just now. He also used uh, some foraminifera to look at the chemical pollution itself. And there were also several studies that investigate you know, thermal pollution or oil pollution and how this has changed the foraminifera assemblage itself. And the best thing is that if you ask me why foraminifera, um, because they change very fast and they are fossilized. So you can study, uh, if you can date them, you can tell how um, you know, the changes has been going on since the um, industrial revolution, and, or maybe particularly which year you think that the pollution started. Uh, and we had one um, study in Terengganu itself where we look at the aquaculture um, aquaculture impact on the lagoon itself. So we dated that core and by looking at that core, uh, this uh, study was published by Culver. Um, he was able to tell you when the aquaculture started and when it ended and what happened to the environment be, uh, before, during, and after. So it was very interesting study. So that was in Setiu Lagoon by Calvert. All right, so, uh, and then in 2003, um, there has been a, a published book by Hellock et al, whereby she has proposed the use of foraminifera in reef monitoring. So um, her argument was, um, Foraminifera is very easy to get. You can eat, uh, simply you know, scoop some sand and you get lots of them. And foraminifera change very rapidly and they are very sensitive to uh, any small changes. And one more good thing about foraminifera or advantage about reef foraminifera is that they also host uh, algae or diatom. So these algae are... Uh, similar, uh, this algae requires similar environment with those of coral reef. So if anything happened to forum, we know that the same thing will happen to the coral. So Hellock has proposed that we use several, you know, um, um, assemblages by looking at assemblages, we use, you know, a larger benthic forum and some heterotrophic forum. We calculate this ratio and we can tell, um, what is the condition or the health condition of the um, reef environment. So this is, um, we had um, tried this in our um, uh, Malaysia as well, and I will show you the result afterward. So it was a very useful and good monitoring tool, I would say. And next, uh, foraminifera has also been used in pollution monitoring, especially related to heavy metal, whereby I think uh, similar thing as Professor Suresh has um, showed to us, there are some, you know, test deformation. If you have uh, too much of heavy metal loading, you get test deformation. Um, the, uh, the shape of the test of foraminifera itself change because of um, the, the increased level of heavy metal itself. But then there are also several studies that says that um, test deformation or abnormalities does not necessarily uh, represent badly polluted environment, but it may also represent uh, a, a natural condition whereby if you have a lot of um, wave or very um, fast current environment or ch uh, sudden changes of salinity, the test will also change. So we also investigate this um, in one of our um, sites in Malaysia, and I will talk uh, about that later. So 
how foraminifera work as bioindicator in tropical water. So if you look at the previous study, most of the earlier study um, has usually focused on the temperate region um, or in other tropical setting, but not in around Malaysia. So what we did was we, we were trying to understand whether the similar index can work in Malaysia and we are try, uh, putting it to test whether you know, it can really tell us uh, this condition is not good or this environmental condition is better or not. All right, so because we know that most severely polluted areas are often naturally stressed. And we, when we talk about polluted areas, these areas are usually very, co uh, very close to the coastline. When they are very close to the coastline, they experience changes um, in the intertidal, the subtidal, the very shallow subtidal. They are prone to any changes, any, um, say, monsoon changes. It will change the salinity. It will change the depth, water depth, and so on. And this include all this marginal marine environment. Naturally, they are changing all the time. Hence, it is very difficult to interpret what portion of that um, foraminifera is actually representing, um, I would say, uh, anthropogenic effect or what portion is, um, you know, representing the natural changes. So this is why we are very interested in uh, testing this index in our region because we know that different places have different, um, I would say, the different sets of environmental uh, parameters. And this um, varied be between region and location. So here is our first study um, on the reef for Manifera. This was actually conducted in 2000, I think it was in 2017. So we went to the very beautiful island. Um, island, uh, we call it uh, Tioman Island. It is actually a marine park. Uh, you can see from this picture, you only have several uh, villages, house, and um, the condition of the sea is quite quite calm, and there are uh, an extensive coral reef uh, environment around that island. So where is this island? So this is the South, uh, South China Sea, and this is the uh, Strait of Malacca that flows into this uh, and Andaman. Uh, see, and here is our um, um, small island. We call it uh, Tioman Island. And on the Tioman Island itself, um, on the west, I would say on the west, there are much more uh, development. But on the east coast of that um, island, there were less. Uh, development. This is because you get lots of rocks, more hilly slope on the uh, east coast of that particular um, island. So you can see residential-wise, you have lots of residential area here on the west coast. And you also have resorts built along this coast, but less on the other side of that island. So to be fair, we, we sample both sides just to see um, what do foraminifera show about um, the developed and less developed uh, part of that island. All right, so during field sampling, uh, we collect the uh, sample by scuba diving. So I, I have a, a, a video here. I'm not sure whether it will play. Yeah, it plays. So basically, um, this is the Tioman Island where we go. So we took several of our um, master's students with us because uh, you have lots of sampling stations and when you dive, it is very tiring. So we keep on switching um, divers just for us to get um, all those uh, 33 samples that we need to cover our object. So this is us going heading to the uh, sampling location and one of the consistent that diver he was always there and this is what we did we set up transat and we scoot up the samples
you can see there are corals. There are places without less coral cover and there are places with much more coral cover. And we also took the in situ parameters um, for the record. So once um, all the samples are back, we do the subsampling, we do all the normal um, foraminifera analysis. Oops, sorry. Next. All right. So what we did we observe from that? And that was a very tiring experience, actually. Uh, we were there for one week um, because um, after the uh, fourth dive, usually um, we were very um, exhausted and we have to stop and we have to start another day. So what did we observe from that um, sample? So basically, you get lots of larger benthic foraminifera that host uh, algae inside. You can see these are all these um, larger benthic foraminifera that have algae or diatom inside them. And then uh, you have um, the famous um, cosmopolitan um, foraminifera like ammonia, alphidium, and we also have bolivina here. All right, so um, what do we see is that um, the result indicate that most sampling sites are very conducive for reef growth. We compare this result with um, coral reef uh, health check by other um, publication and they got similar result as ours. The site where you have more developed um, um, or the, the, the site of the island which is much more developed represent a much less um, health, uh, 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 poor health uh, environmental condition. Our foraminifera also degrade uh, at the, that site and on the east coast of that island, the foraminifera flourish similar with the live coral and you also get much more species on the east uh, compared to the west. And this um, paper has been published in a uh, scientific report uh, recently. Uh, I am glad to say this year we have um, successfully published this in the uh, scientific result, uh, report. All right, so as I said before, we can conclude that uh, here where you have lots of uh, dead coral as well, um, our forum index shows a very poor environmental condition. Whereas on this side where you get a very healthy coral, very diverse coral reef uh, environment, we also, uh, the forum index also shows a very good environmental condition. So, um, I can say for sure that the forum index is applicable to um, the, the coral reef area around Malaysia. All right, so next we are trying to look at the foraminifera stress index. So what is foraminifera stress index? So this is another index just to check whether you have a moderate, um, heavily polluted or very good environment. So this index is actually derived from forum index. So this, um, the Miza here, she took forum index and she somehow correct the, the um, it is still a proportional or ratio counting, but she has um, correct the calculation a little bit and we get a new tool, the forum manifera stress index. So what is the best about this FSI is that you can apply them in non-coral reef areas. So remember the forum index is just for coral reef and FSI you can apply in non-coral reef area. And this way you can tell whether your coastal area is um, healthy or in poor environmental condition. And we did this, uh, we did a, a similar um, study uh, in uh, the northern part of uh, Strait of Malacca. And we purposely choose uh, an island called Langkawi Island. So this is a very famous tourist hotspot and you get um, a lot of um, boats and ferries commu uh, commuting with, between this um, peninsula Malaysia and the island. So every day you got lots of boats coming through and going in and out of this um, small channel. So what we did is that we built a transect here and we try to understand if the FSI can um, you know, mean something here. So this is our result. So if you can see clearly, I think this is quite small. Uh, this is the water depth, right? Some part are deeper here. The, the, um, the, the fairer 
uh, the lighter uh, shape is um, shallower. And you get to see that the FSI here, this is the Foraminifera Stress Index. The red color represents a very stressed environment, while um, the green color is the you know, good environment. And it, it matches with our pay, um, pollution load, load index. Uh, we also study metal, so we get our PLI uh, index, and it match. You can see here that in the um, station 17, you get similar um, reading. So the foraminifera stress index shows a very poor environmental condition when you get an enrichment of um, certain heavy metal. In our case, it was um, lead, lead and cadmium. So the conical correspondent analysis, if any of you are very uh, familiar with this, this is CCA also confirmed that in that particular area, the foraminifera show a very good relationship with um, dissolved oxygen, um, heavy metal concentration, and water depth, which means certain species may live in um, area where you have higher heavy metal, while other species you know, just disappear when you have higher uh, level concentration of heavy metal. And certain species would love um, a very good oxygenated um, sediment, while other species, you know, uh, they, they can survive in less or what we call hypoxic environment. And from this, we understand that we can use the FSI in our study. And this study has also been published. We published in the same journal as the MISA, which is the ecological indicator. And um, it is a very uh, great, uh, it was a, a very good achievement for us because we know that uh, other than coral reef, we can also monitor other environmental set setting by using foraminifera. All right, and this is the last one. Uh, this is um, the one that has not been published yet because we were having um, so much um, trouble interpreting what is the forum trying to tell us. So this study is from the Langkawi Island itself. So Langkawi Island is a, a geopark um, island because of their national geo heritage. Uh, you have some Cambrian rocks. Uh, over there and lots of geological cool stuff. I think if you're a geologist, you, want, you may want to go to Langkawi as well. All right, so what happened is that we try to sample, this is a lagoon, this is all mangrove environment. So we sample along the mangrove and we sample also along the lagoon. And what did we observe? Um, oh yeah, uh, I forgot to tell you that we sample this by using grab sample, just the one in reef environment that we have to scuba dive because we do not want to disturb or destroy the reef environment. So what do we observe? So this is very interesting. We see a lot of alphidium and ammonia in our mangrove environment. There are also some mangrove uh, species, but um, ammonia and alphidium was the, the, the most dominant species. And to our surprise, we have um, this weird looking uh, um, alphidium. At first, we thought this is test abnormalities. And we try to match our geochemical uh, analysis. We are trying to see if, you know, if there is any other metal that is very high or con the concentration increases, but there are none. Most of the heavy metal concentration is, is telling us that this is a normal, environment, there is no heavy metal pollution here, but we still get our alphidium funny looking like this. And when we um, look up more and we talk to some of the uh, expert that was doing on test abnormalities, so this is uh, different from test deformation. So in area where you have uh, heavy metal load, too much of heavy metal concentration, the test will deform. That means the foraminifera cannot build their tests correctly. So you see, this is the normal form. So when they are deformed, they cannot build it, uh, the, the test normally. But in area where you have uh, sudden salinity changes, such as the mangrove. So if you look at our um, 
study area. This is where the seawater come in and you have all these um, river channels here. And in times where the low tide or the high tide happen, the changes of salinity happen very, very fast. And this will cause a stress to the um, alphidium. That is point number one. Point number two is that we only see the abnormality in the test only in this area. None of that um, particular abnormality were found in the rest of the lagoon or the middle channel. We only find it here. And when we run uh, wave stimulation and current stimulation uh, model, we can see that the current was very, very high energy. It has high energy in this channel. And when we look closely, we understand that because of the high current, the test or the uh, alphidium might be heating uh, much more sand grain or each other. So they will lose some part of their test and they try to recover. And this is what make they look very abnormal. They are not deformed, but they are abnormal. And this uh, is, oh, I think, one of the findings that says that not all deformation or abnormality has to do with um, pollution. So we have to be careful when we uh, try to interpret the environment. So this is what we found in our study. And this has not been published yet. We are still working on it. Uh, final drafts, I guess, um, because um, my um, this is uh, uh, some paper that I co-authored, not not as my own student. So we are still waiting for the student to finalize the um, paper. So this is one of the uh, example of deformation, other than abnormality. So you can see my uh, alphidium is more of abnormal, but this one where they study in uh, 4M in Italy you can see that uh, they are deformed. This is the deformation. And they usually happen in only one species. Like for instance, in our case, just the alphidium. And in Italy, it's just the ammonia. So because <coughs> in Italy, ammonia was the last one standing. They were, uh, ammonia was uh, what we call a stress tolerant species. So, I think they were the last one standing, even though the, the, the condition was not very favorable, but because of that, they, they deform. All right, so our future plan and work, uh, we would like to apply all those indexes that I've talked about more on other areas around Malaysia. Probably um, we can expand to the, um, the West, uh, east of Malaysia, which is um, the Borneo part, where you have lots of uh, much more uh, beautiful coral reef. All right, and uh, we would also uh, compare, I would like to compare the highly developed <coughs> west coast, which is along the Malacca Strait, and the east coast, which is the least developed uh, part of Malaysia. We would like to compare what is the uh, marine environment by using coral manifera. So that is what our future work and plan is. Thank you. All right. Yes. Hi. Hi, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for your detailed presentation. And there are some uh, questions in the chat box. All right. What are the main functions of coral manifera? Is that the first one, I guess? Um, the main function of coral manifera. So uh, they, they live in the bottom of the ocean. They can be, uh, they recycle the nutrients. They can be the source of carbonates. Um, to the seafloor. I guess that is the function of foraminifera uh, in the modern environment. But if you ask me the function of foraminifera for geologists, then I would say uh, they can represent age stratigraphy. They are a very good indicator of age, uh, different rock types.
types, you have different age, and because they evolve through times, you have only certain species appearing at certain age. So by looking at the indicator species, you can tell which age is that rock. All right, uh, yes. Um, Oh, can I ask one question? Oh, yes, sure. Sir. Uh, uh, thank you very much. A very nice presentation. Uh, I'm a little bit interested about your indexes. Is there any mm -hmm. seasonal variation of the index? Did you look at any seasonal variation or the seasonal variation of the ocean dynamics is changing the index? All right, um, so uh, we haven't looked at any uh, seasonal changes yet, but we have uh, did some coring um, sample we did call some sample and we don't see any huge changes in terms of foraminifera assemblages in the similar place but i can assure you that um during our sampling was not um it was like between monsoon so we are not sure what will happen if it's you know um during monsoon or during drier period that yeah, I, think, I, think there should, I think there should be some signal of seasonal variation on the mm -hmm. index. Mm -hmm. But excellent work. Uh, congratulations. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Fatim Minhat. Is there any other questions? So hope, uh, hope there is no much questions on this session again. And thank you very much, Dr. Fatim Minhat. And now thank we you. are... Now we are moving to the valedictory session. Thank you, everyone. Greetings from Christ College. A very warm welcome to all. It is a wonderful day, and I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all the to all to the valedictory ceremony of International Ecolloquium on Environmental Degradation and Climate Change, organized by the Center for Environmental Science, University of Madras in collaboration with Department of Geology and Environmental Science, Christ College Autonomous Irinyalakuda, and Department of Geology, University of Madras. Climate change, progressive environmental degradation, sea level rise, polar ice melts, global warming, extreme weather events, irregular rainfalls, extreme heat waves, severe droughts are the most hot topics of discussion of this decade. The impact due to these events are expected to intensify in the coming decades as well. Regional climate change has a vital role and significance in the sustainable existence of natural systems. Hence, this international ecolloquium has its own significance and it is indeed. Last three days, we had wide range of lecture series which tried to cover all the important areas of relevance to the colloquium. May I request Professor Dr. M. Suresh Gandhi, Professor and Head in Charge and the Convener of the Ecolloquium, Center for Environment and Science, University of Madras, for the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you. So, most respected Chief Guest of this validity function, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Varshini, Head of uh, International Scientific Co uh, Cooperation in the Ministry, Department of uh, Science and Technology, Government of India, respected Head of the Department, Professor S. M. Hussain, sir, <coughs> respected Head of the Department, Dr. Linda Alapat from Christ College, Trichur, respected eminent speakers from India and abroad, particularly uh, Professor Sahidul Islam, who is here, Professor Patin Zadi Minahat from Malaysia Tarangan University, respected professors from various universities, colleges, faculties from geology department, Christ College, and our own department, our former head of the department, Professor S.P. Mohan, sir, and my colleague, Dr. Saravanan, assistant professor, uh, guest faculties, Dr. A. Ramachandran and Dr. A. Rajkumar from geology department, University of Madras, Professor Vail Murugan from uh, Satya Baba University, and uh, all delegates from India and abroad, professors, uh, um, <coughs> my dear research scholars, student participants, 
good evening to one and all now we are all coming to the end of the show so on this occasion it is essential for all to realize that every little deed matters when it comes to saving the environment no matter how small a step you taking a lead of greater lifestyle it does make a difference because everything starts doing little deeds one by one it will turn into something big as the saying goes every drop makes a ocean it is true in the case as well <clears throat> as far as the lot of diseases that originates due to unhygienic living conditions and dirty water so we must begin there for instance when water remains stagnant or unclean for long various insects and the bacteria starts growing there so these results in deadly diseases like malaria and dengue and more and more diseases so we must make sure uh, to do some things uh, <clears throat> so we can control that disease similarly we have to talk about the issues of garbage disposals essentially in our country people litter and around everywhere so it is essential to firstly dispose of waste properly and also segregate the wet and dry waste accordingly so these little deeds will make you realize how wholesome your life will become so it is not always about the money and luxury the little fulfilling things and change in habits can also prove to be a very effective so all the resources of nature from forest to oceans and soil to air we must conserving so to sum up it always remember that gifts and blessings which nature endows offers are priceless it is rather essential to conserve them all for better future and life for all so always remember that small steps will help you reach your goal so with these few words i welcome all of you uh, during the last minute we only <coughs> last minute only we contact uh, dr varshni sir uh, so without any hesitation immediately he accept our invitation such a great a gentleman a nice person sir i once again welcome you for this validity function next i welcome our head of the department professor s m hussain sir whenever i approach for any help without any hesitations he provided support for me i welcome you sir and i equally welcome uh, head of the uh, department of geology uh, dr lindo alappa christ college kerala for his support and uh, encouragement uh, <coughs> welcome you sir so in this great occasion i welcome my student and organizing secretary of this colloquium he is the man who made this colloquium in successful way so with this uh, within the short span of time even though during this uh, onam festival holidays he came to the department and made all the arrangements with excellent manner so i welcome uh, the organizer tarun and also his team members they are all done a very good job uh, <clears throat> particularly all the assistant professors from christ college uh, they are also helping us uh, for uh, conducting this uh, international colloquium with a successful manner so i welcome all of you i once again welcome all the senior professors eminent speakers head of the departments uh, faculties research scholars organizing committee members and also from christ college in kerala from and also from madras university and the delegates for this validity function thank you thank you thank you sir thank you very much now i would like to invite dr s m husain professor and head and the convener of ecolocium department of geology university of madras to introduce our chief guest of the day dr s k b varshney advisor and head international cooperation department of science and technology government of india for the valedictory address over to you so husain sir yeah thank you nandini a very good sure, afternoon sir. to one and all 
we have come to an end of this uh, three days uh, e colloquium it is being well organized and uh, thanks to all the people who have supported us and uh, in this uh, valedictory function uh, within a short span of time when we approached dr uh, sk varshini as uh, one of the uh, i mean as professor m suresh gandhi just now mentioned when we approached him he readily accepted our uh, request and uh, to be a chief guest of this uh, valedictory function and uh, he extended his support also to us and uh, it is my uh, pleasure in giving a brief uh, introduction about uh, dr sk varshini he completed his masters degree in geology in the year 1984 from aligarh muslim university with a, a medal for obtaining first rank uh, in his msc then he qualified ugc net in 1985 for junior research fellowship and lecturership afterwards he pursued research at the university of delhi during the period 1985 to 1990 on himalayan river systems sedimentation diagenetic and tectonic modifications then he was also awarded dr d n wadia research fellowship in the year 1986 for his research on himalayan geology after that he joined dr sanjeev kumar varshini uh, he joined the dst in the year 1990 and presently he is heading the international scientific cooperation in the ministry of uh, department of science and technology government of india and he is uh, facilitating international scientific cooperation from the department of science and technology with its bilateral multilateral and regional scientific partners he is uh, indian co-chair governing body indo german science and technology center and uh, indo us endowment fund and he is the member of uh, board of directors of private limited company global innovation and technology alliance and he is also the member of governing councils of us india education foundation international advanced research center of powder metallurgy etc he is uh, indian focal point for brics working group on science and technology and uh, oecd committee on science and technology policy and he is also the member of several uh, board of studies board of research studies in department of geology aligarh muslim university and uh, he has worked as counselor with embassy of india in moscow to facilitate bilateral scientific cooperation between india and russia during april 2008 to june 2011 he has been contributing to promotion of international scientific cooperation as well as scientific industrial cooperation and uh, he is the life fellow of geological society of india bangalore nepal geological society kathmandu and member of international association of sedimentologists oxford and uh, to his credit he has number of certifications and he has also taught he has also has uh, teaching experience he he taught in kurukshetra university in the year 1990 and uh, he has written several uh, articles in science policies focusing on international scientific cooperation he is also involved in scientific uh, popularization science popularization for which he writes several newspapers and magazines as offline as well as online articles so he uh, he has been popularizing science since his inception in dst and uh, with this brief uh, introduction and uh, i welcome you sir dr sk varshini sir for this uh, 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 valedictory function to give your valedictory remarks thank you professor hussain and uh, namaskar to everyone thankful to dr hussain and dr gandhi who invited me for this function uh, to this e colloquium on uh, environmental degradation and climate change friends we are the member of a unique planet probably the only one which supports life not only because we have air and water but also because nature has gifted us with a food cycle and enough resources to survive sustain and even grow over the period there are changes in our hydrosphere atmosphere and 
even in lithosphere. We are talking about plate tectonics, continental drift, landslides, unusual and harsher weather conditions, melting glaciers, sea level rises, cyclones, climate change, etc. Of course, most of them are natural phenomena, but they have been aggravated by anthropogenic practices. Continued unabated anthropogenic pollution and greenhouse gas emission is further increasing or expediting climate change pattern. And even if- Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Yeah. Uh, your camera, can you adjust your camera, sir? Your full uh, face uh, is not visible. Oh, I'm sorry. Just a moment. Is it better now? Yes, better, sir. It's sir. better. It is better. Yes. Uh, so even if all emission from human activity would suddenly stop, climate would continue to change because this is a natural phenomena only being expedited by the human or anthropogenic process. So what we realize that uh, uh, these human activity will increase global warming, ocean acidification, desertification, and change the climate patterns. So these are being aggravated by pollutions, over exploitation of natural resources, environmental degradation, and these will lead to more severe, pervasive, and probably irreversible changes for people, assets, economies, and ecosystem around the world. Uh, in this webinar, we learned from various eminent speakers on climate change, sea level change, its impact on ecosystem and conservations, varied profile of rainfalls, heat waves, technology for environmental sustainability. And I shall put today my focus on extreme weather events. So as you all know, extreme weather events are those events, unexpected, unusual, severe, or unseasonal activities that ranges uh, has been. And uh, these events are based on locations rec uh, recorded weather history. So whenever there is a variation of more than 10%, these are called extreme uh, uh, events. And there are evidences which suggest that climate change is increasing the periodicity and intensity of some of these extreme weather events. Confidence in attribution of extreme weather and, uh, and other events to anthropogenic climate change is highest in uh, changing, changing the frequency or magnitude of the extreme heat and uh, cold conditions. And, sorry, uh, extreme heat and cold. So confidence uh, is there. And uh, if you see the picture on the global level in 2020, then Asia suffered six of the 10 most expensive extreme weather events. And virtually almost all part of the world had recorded such things. So be it fires in Australia or United States, floods in China and India, or maybe Japan, storm in Europe and America. So almost every part of the globe has been touched by climate related disaster in 2020 with catastrophic results for millions of people. And there has been a study which says that this would result into migration of people. And about 62, 62 million people are likely to be displaced in South Asia, mainly because of this change in sudden change in uh, climate conditions. If we see our own country, so we know that even this year, there have been uh, several parts which are battling deadly floods and landslides after heavy monsoon rains, uh, which is another example how climate change is affected. In the first seven years of this month, uh, we have noticed 
that uh, 1.3 billion people has experienced well, india has experienced two major cyclone a deadly glacier collapse and sweltering heat wave and killer floods so if i could uh, just make a small comments on each one of them so in feb uh, on glaciers melting glaciers in february a ferocious flash flood uh, came in the remote indian himalayan valley sweeping away homes and a hydroelectric plant and around 200 people only 60 body could be found uh, we believe experts believe that it was the major cause was that a massive chunk of glacier equivalent to a uh, size of about 15 football feet uh, it break off from the mountains and glaciologists who investigated the site uh, they said that it is clearly a fall out of climate change and uh, in itself is telling how our future is going to be in the himalayan region there are about 10000 glaciers which are receding at a rate of 30 to 60 meters uh, per decade as the global temperature is rising similarly if we see in the southern india then cyclones are there and they are not a rare sight in northern indian oceans but scientists say that they are becoming more frequent and severe as the temperature is rising in may cyclone taukte claimed nearly 155 lives in western india including dozens working on oil rigs of mumbai it was the fiercest storm to hit this area uh, west india uh, in several decades and nearly a week later we had another Uh, cyclone yas with the winds equivalent uh, of a category 2 hurricanes which killed nine people and forced evacuation of more than 1.5 million people in the east so with waves of height of double decker buses hundreds of thousands people lost their homes right and then the, if we talk about the heat wave the indian average temperature has been rising at its level of 0.7 degree celsius and uh, between uh, in last several uh, years and it is expected that it may be about 4.4 degree higher in another 50 years so uh, several million people have seasoned in the just latest heat wave across in northern india indian weather department has declared heat wave almost every year in the last decades and temperature touching a mark of nearly 50 degree uh, in this uh, part northern part of the country and there are newspaper report that heat wave has uh, caused death of nearly 17000 people in last 100 years so imagine today india is using indian households are using air conditioning system which is only 5% so 5% people are using whereas if we compare country like united states or china where 90% people are using air conditioner so if indian population using air conditioners increases you can imagine how difficult it would be another major factor which we have faced this year and even last year is the monsoonal floods so the torrential rain have hit western coast of uh, india in uh, triggering landslides and leaving more than uh, 100 people uh, dead and missing and hillside resort of mahabaleshwar reported a nearly 60 cm of rains in 24 hour period which is very very rare and neighboring state of goa is also saw the worst flood so flooding and landslides are common during india's monsoon season which is also often seen uh, uh, as the poorly constructed building buckle under the pressure of non stop rain and climate change is making monsoon stronger so each year even if its period is small whenever it comes it comes with full intensity and it is it warns of potentially severe consequences for food farming and economy affecting uh, a fifth of world population another major thing is lightning the monsoon from june to september also bring the dangers from the sky uh, in 2019 alone more than 3000 people were killed 
by the lightning. Uh, earlier this month, even we saw that uh, 76 people in uh, perished in Rajasthan uh, because of this. So there are number of uh, uh, factors, number of parameters, how we can notice uh, climate change to come and also impacting our life. So what we are assuming is that the climate system have a certain level of natural variability. Extreme weather event can occur for several reasons, even beyond human impact, including change in pressure or movement of air. Areas along the coast or those located in the tropical region are more likely to experience storms with heavy precipitation from temperate region, although such event uh, can occur anywhere. Uh, not every unusual weather can be blamed on climate change. The atmosphere is a complex and a dynamic system influenced by several factors such as natural tilt and orbit of the earth, absorption or reflection of solar radiation, movement of air masses and hydrological cycle. Due to this, weather pattern can experience some variation and so extreme weather can be attributed at least in part to some of the natural variability that exists on Earth. Climatic variations such as El Nino, Southern Oscillation on the North Atlantic Oscillation impact weather uh, patterns in specific region of the world influencing temperature and precipitation. The record breaking extreme weather event uh, that have been cataloged throughout the past 200 years uh, most likely arise when climate patterns like INSO or NAO network in same direction as human induced warming. In general, climate model shows that with climate change, the planet will experience more extreme weather. Storms such as hurricanes or tropical cyclones may experience greater rainfall causing major flooding events or landslide by saturating soil. And this is because warmer air is able to hold more moisture due to water molecules having increased kinetic energy and precipitation occurs at a greater rate because more molecules have critical speed needed to fall as the rain drops. A shift in rainfall pattern can lead to greater amount of precipitation in one area while another area may experience hotter and drier condition which can lead to the drought. This is because an increase in temperature also lead to an increase in evaporation at the surface of the earth. So more precipitation does not mean universally wetter condition or a worldwide increase in drinking water. Some studies assert that there is a connection between rapidly warming Arctic temperature and thus a vanishing cryosphere to extreme weather in mid latitude. In a study published in Nature, scientists used several simulations to determine that the melting of ice sheet in Greenland and Antarctica could affect overall sea level and sea temperature. Other models have shown that temperature rise and subsequent addition of melt water to the ocean could lead to a disruption of thermoline circulation, which is responsible for the movement of seawater and distribution of heat around the globe. A collapse of the circulation in Northern Hemisphere would lead to increase in extreme temperature in Europe, as well as more frequent storms by throwing off natural climate variability conditions. Thus, increasing temperature causing glaciers to melt, mid-latitude could experience shift in weather pattern and temperature. How does it impact on human activity? That's a major area of uh, interest. And uh, while burning fossil fuel is the most obvious way the human have influenced weather climate event, there are plenty of other anthropogenic activities. Urban planning often amplifies flooding impact, especially in areas that are at increased risk of storms due to its location and climatic variability. Increasing amount of impervious surfaces such as sidewalks, roads, roof means that less of the water from incoming storm is absorbed by the land. The destruction of wetland 
which act as a natural reservoir by absorbing water, can intensify the impact of floods and extreme precipitation. This can happen both inland and at the coast. However, wetland destruction along the coast can mean decreasing an area of natural cushions, thus allowing storm surges and flood waters to reach farther inland during hurricanes and cyclones. Building homes below sea level or along a flood place put residents at increased risk of destruction or injury in extreme precipitation event. More urban area can contribute to the rise of extreme or unusual weather events. Tall structure can alter the way the wind moves throughout an urban area, pushing warmer air upwards and in inducing convection, creating thunderstorm. Uh, with these thunderstorms comes increased precipitation and which uh, because of the large amount of impervious sur surfaces in the city can have devastating impact. I impervious surfaces also absorb energy from the sun and warm the atmosphere causing drastic increase in temperature in urban areas. This along with pollution and heat released from car and other anthropogenic sources contribute to urban heat islands. As temperature continue to rise due to such emissions, heat wave uh, could become more common or threatening in urban area. Additionally, high population density in city exacerbate human loss in many extreme weather conditions, events. Overall, while human activity can have a direct impact on weather, weather pattern, it is just important to consider how human uh, action can exacerbate the effect and losses from extreme weather events. Concerning uh, human uh, anthropogenic uh, global warming, the study also provides projection for future extreme heat incidents, and they have ob uh, observed that uh, there would be a probability of recording week-long heat extreme occurrence depending upon the uh, warming rate rather than global warming level. So uh, with these words, I would like to come to an end and I look forward for a continued interactions of various group of earth scientists and biologists to discuss further the concern of climate change should we arrest it, its speed? If yes, how and how it is going to impact human migration, human health, food availability, economy, and other aspects. My department, Department of Science and Technology, is uh, having a program where we are looking for mitigation of natural disasters. And we would like to invite all the researchers, uh, if they could come and participate in this program. and. Uh, contribute new knowledge on uh, mitigation of this uh, uh, natural disaster. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your valuable insights on the extreme weather events. Thank you. Now it's open to the participants. We are requesting the participants to give your valuable comments and suggestions. You can raise your hands or unmute yourself to express yourself. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, everyone. I'm Ansi George from Christ College, Irinyalakuda. And I have been attending the colloquium on environmental degradation and climatic change was really amazing. When I am talking about the colloquium, first of all, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all the eminent speakers who were present from all over the world. I would also like to congratulate all those who were behind this program to make it a grand success. Never stop learning because life never stops teaching. So attending such colloquium in this COVID-19 pandemic, it helped us to keep ourselves motivated and focused. Once again, thank you. Thank you for the organizers and speakers who made this colloquium very, really fruitful and interesting and allowing me to be a part of this. The sessions was really great. I hope to see some more sections like this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ansi. Thank you very much. Anyone else? 
Hello. Yes. Yes. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Finally, I would like to conclude, and I would like to give my vote of thanks in my own style. So yeah, let sure. me just just read. I have just written few lines. Satellite imageries with false colors, with bands joined in multiples. University of Madras, along with other, being one of the best space labors with hyperspectral data as cables. Water bodies bare and woven by this across nations and with grids. Whether an open desert or big houseless, having a command over climate change, water, cloud. Water vapor, as because Earth is borderless. Thank you, madam. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yamini Malhotra, for your uh, advice. So I think it's the second time you are uh, giving such a poems, right? Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. really wonderful, and thank you very much from our side. It's the very first okay. experience that we are having when a participant is giving a poem or uh, lines to appreciators. It was really great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. um any other participants you're all welcome is there anyone else okay hope um there is no other comments okay anyway thank you thank you very much yamni and ansi next um to extend the vote of thanks i call up mr tarun r assistant professor and the organizing secretary of the Ecolocium, Department of Geology and Environmental Science, Christ College Autonomous, Kerala. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Nandini, ma'am. So, a good afternoon to all and all present here. Our esteemed chief guest, Dr. S.K. Varshini, advisor and head international corporation, DST New Delhi, respected process, colleagues, and all the participants. Like everything has an end. This colloquium also has to end. It has been a very wonderful three days of deliberations, talks, where we had many thought-provoking sessions. It is certainly an honor for me to get an opportunity to thank you all, and to thank you all the dignitaries on this platform. First, I would like to thank, or first I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. S. Gaudi, Honorable Vice Chancellor, University of Madras, for all the help he had offered for the conduct of this event. Thank you, sir. Next, I extend my gratitude to our chief guest of the validity function, Dr. S. K. Varshini, to take out time from his busy schedule to grace this occasion. Thank you for your inspiring and encouraging words in the final session of this three-day international ecologium, sir. Thank you. Next, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Devesh K. Sinha from University of Delhi for inaugurating this program. Thank you, Devesh, sir. Next, I would like to thank Dr. S.M. Hussain and Dr. Suresh K. M. Suresh Gandhi, my beloved teachers and the conveners of this e colloquium, for their unconditional support from the inception of the idea for organizing such a program. Without them, I'm sure that I would not be able to organize such a program. Thank you, both of you. Next, I would like to thank all the eminent speakers, both from India as well as abroad, who had cooperated and offered to share their experience for a larger audience in this colloquium. It was evident from the quantum of discussion that your words are triggered thoughts, thoughts for many to engage in the research more efficiently. And please accept our sincere gratitude for being here with us in these days, sir. Thank you all. And also, I extend my sincere gratitude to our principal, Reverend Dr. Jo, uh, Dr. Jolie Andrew CMI, for his wholehearted support and encouragement in organizing such an event. Thank you, Father. I must mention my deep sense of appreciation to Dr. Linto Alapat, Assistant Professor and Head, Department of Geology, Christ College, Irinyalakoda, for his enthusiastic support and motivation throughout this event. Thank you, Dr. Linto Alapat. And also, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all my colleagues of the department from uh, Department of Geology and Environmental Science, Christ College, and all the faculty and other, other members from University of Madras who had worked hard to make this event a successful one. Thank you all. And next, I would like to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge the effort taken by 
Mr. Hariharan for the technical support in smooth conduct of this program and would like to express my gratitude here. And now it's my time to extend our sincere thanks to all the participants for your active participation throughout the program. Thank you very much for all the interesting questions, discussions, poems, and that you have raised at the end of each session, which made the colloquium very dynamic. On behalf of the entire team of Christ College Autonomous City Nalagura, I wish to express my gratitude to on and all. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you all being here for these three days. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope to see you again next time. Feedback form will be provided in the chat box. So officially, we are concluding all the sessions and our valedictory session ceremony as well. Thank you once again. Hope to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nandal. Thank you, thank you, thank you, the organizers. Thank you from Bangladesh. And when they uh, this COVID period is over, you are welcome to be, make a visit and let us have collaborative works in future. And I really enjoy, and my team also attended. They also enjoy the session. Thank you very much for all these things. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Sagid al Islam, sir. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Leaving the meeting. Thank you, sir.